。好，我们接下来第二位 Kino。好，我们这一次大会其实希望是有更多跟以往不太一样的主题，就是我们很多人。的概念在里面，好，那女性的参与，还有不同不同文化的参与，这这也是我们今年非常希望可以带进来的。好，那我们呃很很荣幸请到这个安娜苏雅，她是 Who's Knowledge 的方呃 founder， 那她也刚刚得到 Oxford Internet 呃呃 Institute 的这个一个奖项。那她可以带给我们的是什么呢？就是我们重新思考，呃，是谁在做？制造网络的这种工具，那我们应该是有更更多的人来加入。那其实，在这些议程当中，我们这一次都很希望是从 user 啊的角度去思考人出发的网络到底是什么样子的面貌。那我们请安娜苏亚So I've always wondered what it might feel like to follow Ethan. Now I know, it's hard. <laughs> um, oh, let's make sure that this is working. Oh, it'll take a little while, I think. Yes. Do I need to press my F7 one, one more time? Let's try that. Yes. Excellent. Gratitude for technology that works. Um, ni hao. Ni hao, my GovZero friends. It is uh, wonderful to be here in Taipei, in Taiwan, land of many indigenous peoples and nations. Yes, that picture is of Theroko National Park, which I hope to visit someday. And it is one of the winning uh, pictures of Wiki Loves Earth, a Wikimedia online photo contest that some of you might be familiar with from last year. I am so happy to be in Asia, land of my birth and always my home. And I'm deeply excited to be with all of you and to learn from you, some of the most inspiring leaders and organizers of global civic tech. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you in particular to my longtime friend and inspiration, Shunling Chen. I don't know where Shunling is. Um, she always helps me make the best kind of trouble or insurrection, as Ethan would say, in the world. Do you need me to do it? Ah, okay. All right. That works? All right. I will be on this side so that I don't do anything to touch that. Um, sometimes technology leads a little bit of coaxing. Um, thank you, too, for all my new friends, for Ipa, for Titicat, for Lulu, who helped, who helped bring me here safely, and to the amazing uh, rest of the GovZero organizing team. Let's try it again. Excellent. Do you, yeah. uh, you just need it? Just need it. Need the. Yeah? What do you need? Yeah? The color? Yeah. Maybe my brightness? Do you want my brightness up or down? Is that okay? Everyone see it? Yeah. Okay. Some of this is about going from white to brown and black. <laughs> Sorry, I had to get that in. One of my best friends works with Ethan and works on facial recognition. Um, I, uh, Joy Buell Womuni, and I urge you to look at her work. She does amazing work on issues of, of color um, in our technology. Um, so, my name is Anasuya Sengupta. I'm from India, and like many of you, like many of us in Asia, I grew up speaking many, many languages, and walking, sometimes dancing, between many cultures. 
Yet, as I read the morning newspaper in English, sitting in my hometown of Bengaluru, I wondered why it felt as though I was on the margins of the world, looking towards the center. It felt as though some of the most important events of our time, some of the most important conversations of our time, were all happening in the United States or in Europe. It may not have been so, but it felt so. And it also felt as, that, as though those events and conversations were happening without me, without my people, without my communities. I now live in the United States, and I work with two amazing women, Siko Bouters and Adeli Vrana. Adeli is from Brazil, and Siko is from the Republic of California. To, oh yeah. Someday, California is going to secede from the rest of the United States. That will be an insurrection to watch. Together with friends from around the world, we have set up Who's Knowledge, an online multilingual campaign to make sure that people from India, from Brazil, from Taiwan, never feel as though we are on the margins of the world again. We bring the knowledges of different marginalized communities onto the internet, centering our histories and sharing our knowledges. For us, this is what it means to decolonize the internet. We are hacking at the structures of power and privilege together. I believe that some of the world's worst violence and injustices are at, at the root of some of the world's worst violences and injustices is what I call the hidden crisis of unknowing, of the fact that we don't know each other as fully and as best as we can. So whether as women, as Asians, as people whose first language is not English, decolonizing is a way of talking openly about whose stories and whose faces get seen and heard, whose bodies and ideas are protected and amplified, and through this process to create powerful, radical new ways of knowing and being with each other. So, I am once again so happy to be with all of you at GovZero. And all of you have been decolonizing the internet since you began work together, even if you didn't use the term. As a bunch of nobodies, you've been doing a lot. You've been leading the way for many of us across the world. I'm now going to try and speak these names of inspiring projects for me in Chinese, so I apologize in advance. I want to call out the Urban Dictionary in Taiwanese, Etagi, okay? As well as the dictionary of the, for the indigenous Amis language, which is Amou Mutian. Is that correct? I probably massacred that one. All right, let's, let's go for three of three and a project of national treasure, treasures trying to make visible traces of Taiwan in cultural institutions in the United States. Gyeongja Pauzan. Okay, shishi, thank you. Um, what I want to do today is to look at your communities and mine and think together about how projects like these, about how we can bring different forms of knowledges online and how to do it well, to do it respectfully, to do it by centering our marginalized communities from around the world. Open is not open enough if it is not safe and welcoming for the histories and knowledges of all our peoples. So why is this important? Because between my country and yours, we already have about one-seventh of the world's population and many of the world's top ten spoken languages. The family of Chinese languages, of course, heads the list before English. Yeah, we're doing well. <laughs> 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 
This diversity of language, of culture, and of knowledge is really obvious when you look at Asia in comparison with the world. And I want to offer you the idea that language is a really good proxy indicator of ways of being, of ways of thinking, of ways of knowing, in other words, for what we call knowledge. So I know, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with the difference in the way you think and know and be when you are speaking in English or when you are speaking in Taiwanese, in different forms of China, Chinese. I certainly feel different when I'm thinking in Tamil or in Kannada or in Hindi versus when I'm thinking and speaking in English. So once again, language is a good proxy indicator. It's not the complete picture, but it's useful. Now let's look at who is online. Over half of the world is online today. And three-fourths of those who are online are from our parts of the world, from the global south, from Asia, from At Africa, from Latin America, the Caribbean and the Pacific Islands and the Middle East. And nearly half of those people who are online are women and girls. What is, of course, interesting and unsurprising is half of the world's internet users are from Asia and the Pacific Islands. So let's think about what this means, the fact that we are the ones who are online the most, right? Asia is certainly online. We are 40% of the world's mobile broadband internet users. Um, and we have huge innovative disruptive work in mobile hardware and software. But what we tend to focus our work on is news and communications apps and platforms. We are not at the moment looking as much on creating, curating, and sharing our knowledges and histories. So look at this amazing world, this amazing room um, filled with incredible people. Published knowledge, and particularly public online knowledge, does not look like all of you. It does not look like this room. And the problem is that there's a mythology, a story about how the internet is participatory, democratic, and inclusive for all people for all time. And this is, of course, true. All of us here are living examples of some of that potential. But without calling out the reality of what exists right now, we cannot begin to fix it. I am going to be the nobody for today. So according to research by Google a few years ago, of the 7,000 languages in the world, only 7% of these languages are represented in published material. And according to research by a Who's Knowledge community member, just about a few months ago, Silesh Patnaik, only about 500 or so of those languages are on the internet. So the breadth and range of our knowledges, of our embodied knowledges, what lives in our bodies, in our minds, is not in books and it's not on the internet. It is mostly oral and visual. And yet, the problem is that we think of oral knowledge as not having the same power and authority as that of text, as published knowledge. A friend of ours, Achal Prabhala, has made a wonderful film called People Are Knowledge. It's accessible on Wikimedia Commons, it's true. Um, and it talks about or, or how oral sources can be reliable sources, including for places like Wikipedia. Please watch it if you can, and I will come back to Wikipedia. So the internet often feels like the newspaper that I read growing up in India. It often seems like the knowledge we know best or share the most is that of about one billion people from the United States and Europe, 14% of the world. And even, even within these regions, we know far less about marginalized communities like the Native Americans or the Roma or the Latin American communities or African Americans. 
Oops. Wow, that rendered badly. Let's try that again. Ah, okay, that is definitely rendering badly. Um, if you could see this beautiful slide, <laughs> what it would tell you, really, all right, it's not going to happen. If you could see it, and I can share it with you, um, it's research from the Oxford Internet Institute showing the gap that is really wide between internet users and internet producers, those who produce the technology and the content that is on the internet. Um, what it shows is that the global south lags really behind Europe and North America on domain registrations, on GitHub commits, and on Wikipedia edits. France alone produces over five times more GitHub commits and three times more domain registrations than all of the countries of sub-Saharan Africa together. And this is not because techies don't exist in Africa. We know them, they're amazing, they are our friends. So there's something that is seriously wrong with the way that the internet is designed and produced right now. Let's come to a slide that does work. And let's come to Wikipedia, our favorite online uh, public knowledge site. I love Wikipedia, I am a Wikipedian, and I believe in tough love for the things that I love. Only in critiquing Wikipedia can I hope to improve it. So let's look at some of what happens on Wikipedia. Only one in 10 editors identifies as female or non-binary. Only about 20% of its knowledge is produced on or by people from the global south. This map shows you that in 2012, more Wikipedia articles were produced within that tiny circle that is Western Europe than all of the rest of the world around it. It's quite a map. So now you know why it's urgent and important to decolonize the internet and public knowledge online. How do we do this? Let's go back to why we're here. And as I talk through what we're doing at Whose Knowledge, I want you to think about how your work connects with ours. We know that marginalized communities are the majority of the world, whether as women, indigenous communities, LGBTQI folks, and all of us from the Global South. Our work at Whose Knowledge, therefore, is to center the efforts and leadership of marginalized communities from around the world in adding their knowledges to the internet. We're a research action advocacy group, if you will, because one cannot happen without the other two. We need all three to make change happen. We connect, we collaborate, and we convene. We partner with many other campaigns and organizations and networks to create inclusive, radical, participatory knowledge together, including on Wikipedia. We work with these different communities, sharing ideas, resources, toolkits, and research on not only what we know about the internet, but how we can make it better. We work, for instance, on expanding the sources that we reference online to include more than text sources, like oral and visual archives. We're working with partners like the O Foundation in, in India to expand the range and ease with which knowledge is shared in different languages. Uh, one of the things, really cool things they've done recently is to create a text converter from ASCII to Old Chiki, which is the Santali script. Santali is one of the indigenous languages of India, spoken by over 6.2 million people. And essentially, it is the first indigenous language from South Asia that now has a Wikipedia of its own. And a lot of the effort is in this text conversion, as you can imagine. We also work to make sure that more faces like yours and mine are seen in Silicon Valley offices and in policy making circles where decisions about internet design, architecture, infrastructure and governance are made. So I, I want to honor 
and I want to center three of the communities that we've been working with over the past two years and we have learned so much from. Dalits are a community from South Asia that have been oppressed for millennia by the caste system, which is a form of institutional hierarchy based on pollution and purity. They are formally and pejoratively known as untouchables. We support Equality Labs, which has organized Dalit History Month in India and the diaspora for the past few years, and is bringing Dalit history and knowledge onto Wikipedia and other parts of the online world. We've also worked with Okvir, a feminist LGBTQI group in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which collects oral testimonies and histories for a queer digital archive. And we've supported the Kumeyaay Wikipedia Initiative, which adds knowledge of the Native American Kumeyaay people to Wikipedia and beyond. And through all of this work, we've used two core principles. One is the principle that anyone in an effort like this, anyone who is in a room together, has expertise of some kind. What we are doing is bringing together people of different expertises to come together to make change happen, right? So when we do our editathons, you have a Dalit scholar or a Kumeyaay scholar who knows everything about or a great deal about their own communities. And then we also have a Wikipedian who is expert in wiki syntax or Wikipedia's sometimes really difficult rules. As you know, if any of you is a Wikipedian, that's not easy to do. Um, so that is one principle. And the second principle is that of convening and collaborating across unusual and unlikely allies. For example, with Okvir in the Queer Archive, because it is illegal and it is deeply difficult socially to be queer in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we're making sure that there is resilience of the content that they have created. We have a repository with Internet Archive so that we can create a mirror site if necessary, if, for instance, the government wants to take down their website and these testimonies. These are important ways in which we can work together across the world to make sure that we are both sharing uh, our knowledges and keeping them online. So I don't know how many of you read Wikipedia. Can I get a show of hands? How many of you read Wikipedia? Most of you. How many of you read Wikipedia in one language? OK, just those of us who might be English speakers, possibly. The rest of us read it in multiple languages. OK. Did you know, it's always fascinating with Wikipedia to try and look at one article and see the differences between different languages. That's, that's a nice test um, and it's a beautiful Wikipedia rabbit hole that I encourage you to go down. But one of the things about Wikipedia is that there are only, there are very few biographies of women. Only 17% of all the biographies of uh, people on Wikipedia, what we call notable people, are of women. And of those biographies, only 20% of them have images, have faces to them. Now, one of the ways in which invisibility works is literally, when you don't see the face of an inspiration, it doesn't have as much meaning, it doesn't have as much strength, it doesn't have as much power. So this year, we launched in March, which is the International Women's Month, we launched Visible Wiki Women to bring the faces of notable, important women from around the world onto Wikipedia. We worked with partners and community projects around the world to do this. We had thought we would bring a hundred high quality images onto Wikipedia, and by the end of the month, we had over 800. About Three-fourths of those are already on Wikipedia in different languages. 500 images have inspired new articles to be written about women around the world. We also did something that is part of the way we think about convening. 
We held the Decolonizing the Internet Conference in Cape Town in South Africa with some of you in this room. We brought together activists, scholars, librarians, archivists, and of course, techies and Wikipedians to think about what a decolonized internet might look like and how we can get there. It was an exciting, inspiring set of conversations. And I think one of the reasons it was so exciting and inspiring was because of who was in the room. When you have a room filled with more than half women or trans folks, more than half people of color, and more than half people from the Global South. It is a very different set of conversations around technology and design than it would be in a Silicon Valley office filled with mainly white, mainly male techies. Because we're also pushing the ways in which we think about knowledge beyond text, we held an art exhibition called What is Knowledge? in which we invited artists from around the world, mainly from marginalized communities themselves, to express what it meant to understand knowledge through their art. And this is, you know, my co-founder, um, Siko Bauters, with the amazing uh, South African photographer, Lunga Kama. Now, because we're techies, um, we, we know that we all like our learning patterns, so we created a learning pattern on working as we do. And as you've noticed already, I like asking questions. As Ethan said, there are no easy answers, and there's no one answer, there's no silver bullet. But it's often useful to have the right questions in order to get to the right directions of the ways that we might change the world. And these seven central questions um, are really useful for us, I think, because it helps us think through the, the sort of flowchart of where we might go. Why do you want to do this? Whom do you ask? How do you ask? Where do you begin? How do you design to empower and share leadership? Whom else do you begin, bring in? And what does success look like and to whom? And I know that many of these questions are familiar to all of you in GovZero but I urge you again to think about them with every effort that you make. We learned with our communities, for instance, as, the, as we asked these questions, that there are limits to openness. When we first began conversations with the Kumiai, we assumed that our entry point would be Wikipedia. But we didn't realize, till we were told by our Kumiai friends, that till 1978, it was illegal for Native Americans in the United States to share their faith, their practices, their cultures. It was actually illegal till 1978. And so for that generation of Native Americans, they are not used to being in an open world. They are not used to sharing their knowledge. They're not used to coming out and bringing their knowledge with them. We also learned that for communities like this and many other indigenous communities around the world, some knowledge is sacred knowledge. It is not meant to be shared outside of these communities. So we learned to ask ourselves the questions as open advocates of open data, of open cultures. Um, we learned to ask open for what, open for whom, and open by whom. Now, I'm an Indian woman born into a Savarna or an upper caste um, family in India. My ancestors have been part of the oppressive structure that I told you about, the caste system, like race in the United States or Europe. And it is part of my responsibility to be part of a future in which I challenge not just the power and privilege of others, but my own power and privilege. And so I want to end with the story of Grace Banu. Yes, she's one of the women you saw earlier in the Visible Wiki Women Challenge. Grace's story brings all of our stories together and shows us powerfully how we have many challenges 
and many opportunities in the way we can work towards making the internet feel and look different. As I've said before, over 200 million Dalits across South Asia have struggled for millennia against the oppressive caste system. And they've struggled to share their histories and knowledges, whether in the offline or in the online world. Similarly, many of our friends from LGBTQI communities around the world have struggled to have their stories acknowledged and affirmed. Grace is the first Dalit transgender woman to have an engineering degree from the South Indian state of Tamil Nadu. She is an inspiration to many of us across South Asia. Bringing her biography onto Wikipedia and keeping it there mirrored some of the many challenges Grace has had throughout her life to be recognized and to be celebrated for all the many things that she is. Last year, as I said before, we organized an editathon for Dalit History Month, and Jake, who is an experienced Wikipedian, helped Selvi, who is a newbie Dalit um, organizer, to write Grace's biography. Jake was so inspired by Grace's story that he went back home that night, looked up Grace's Twitter account, found her picture, and brought it and asked for permission to put it on Wikimedia Commons. And through that, Grace now has a biography and a picture on Wikipedia. But the story doesn't end there. One particular Wikipedia editor started questioning the different sources, the different citations that we had used for Grace's story and for many other biographies and articles throughout that editathon. And as one of our Dalit organizers said, this single editor's reversions and edits felt like ongoing trauma for a community that has already felt so much. And I believe, I don't know for certain, that that editor is a Savarna like me, an upper caste person. So again, we have to question and challenge power and privilege, but we start with ourselves. So even as we build and create open online environments, how can these spaces be open, but also safe, welcoming, and inclusive? What happens when we center the creativity and leadership of someone like Grace? What happens when Grace designs these spaces? There's much to be done, and the best way forward is together. So I look forward to talking with all of you over the next two days on how we can work together to bring our knowledges and histories online. I look forward to this bunch of nobodies coming together to make sure we reimagine and redesign the internet to be for and from us all. Shishi Nanri, thank you. OK, thank you, Anna Suya. Actually, for us Taiwanese, it's a very good reminder. Because our identity is quite wrong. Sometimes we forget that we are Asians. And when we go out, we realize that we are Asians. We often have this kind of very wrong feeling. We are probably in a stateless state. OK, the question is, we have two questions. We have two questions. National identities in the global south are complex histories of colonization. How do we center our identities without centering power? That's such an excellent question. Um, and I think there are many ways to think about this. And I think the most important ways are your own. Um, I'm echoing a little bit of Ethan said, the best ways are your own. Ask yourself the question about who is in your friend circle? Ask yourself who you spend time with. Ask yourself who you learn from. If they all look like you, then something is wrong. You haven't decentralized power enough. You haven't decolonized yourself enough. When we are working and living and learning from a diverse set of people, then we create communities that are diverse, plural, 
and deeply, deeply empowering. That's the form of power that we want to see. Power is useful and important, but it is not when it is abuse and authority, right? For the wrong reasons. Empowerment, filling people with a sense of dignity and respect is the kind of power that we want. And that form of power is not a zero sum game. It is not that, you know, when I give away some of my power, um, I'm losing. It means that we share power together. It is power with, not power over. And that, I think, is at the core of decolonization. Next question is raised by Zhi Hao, and we want to see the faces. So ask, yourself, your, ask your question yourself. <laughs> the face. Yes. So, oh shit, I need to find my question. All right. Um, if we look at the current internet as an institution, um, would a truly P2P or a mesh internet something uh, that an insurgentist would uh, pursue? Sort of echoing what uh, Ethan was saying. Over ah, choices. yes. Yeah. Um, also a great question, and from someone whose name means, I believe, immense knowledge. So you probably have the answer to this already. Um, one of the ways I think about um, institutions, this dance between individuals and institutions that Ethan was talking about, is not to look at centralization or decentralization as good and bad in themselves, right? The way that I think about um, this is about looking at distributed forms of systems and governance. There will always be some nodes of centralization, right? And there will always and should be networks of decentralization. Power is both distributed and centralized in different ways. So, for example, it is useful to have a centralized form to some extent of infrastructure that allows us to monitor and regulate it, right? Whether it is submarine cables or, you know, just roads and fiber, fiber cables beneath those roads. At the same time, for those who need the internet access that they cannot get from corporates who may not care about them, things like mesh networks and P2P networks are really important. And I think it is this way of finding solutions for one's own context that is very, very important in a distributed network. We, we need to question whether the centralized nodes are working, and we need to question whether the decentralized nodes are also working for those communities that they wish to serve. Okay, very inspiring. 好 ，Thank you， 杨德书院。这这些题目都已经进入了那个深水区哦，所以有还有很多问题想要问，对不对？还有很多是那个 idea 想要交流。杨德书院也有 on conference tomorrow， you have on conference tomorrow morning， so sign up to on conference， 去看那个上面呃的内容，还有时间地点会明天公布。所以今天我们谢谢杨德书院。